Hi, I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. And this is Northwest Brew Talk. Welcome to Northwest Brew Talk, episode number 57. Each and every week we promote the Washington brewing industry by talking to those people involved in drinking Washington beer. With over 300 breweries, we try to highlight as many as possible every single episode. If you're new to the show, we suggest you check out our back catalog with some great interviews and lots of Washington beer. This week we have an interview with Flying Bike Cooperative Brew, our brew news, and local music from Amy Fike. If you have any comments or questions, send us an email to nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. We are on Twitter at nwbrewtalk and on Facebook at facebook.com slash nwbrewtalk. If you like the show and want to support us, share our link and tell your friends on social media. It takes just a few to start a revolution. To start the show, let's open our first beer. Okay, this is IPA, just a simple name, from Outer Planet Brewing. Outer Planet Brewing is located in Seattle. They've got a cool little brewery that we went and visited. Uh, We're drinking their IPA, what they call a solid West Coast style IPA. Bold, piney aromas and a citrus taste create a solid bitterness that is balanced with a firm maltiness. This approachable yet complex IPA will make your mind go numb. It's 6.5% ABV, 74 IBUs and an untapped rating of 3.66. Yes, did a nice interview with them. That'll be up uh, probably late next month sometime. Good time. Nice little brewery that they have there and a couple, nice couple guys. Yes, family-friendly place too. And this is definitely that got that uh, piney smell. Oh, and, yeah, uh, absolutely. Citrus smell. It's a little darker gold, cop, almost copperish. Mm, that's good. I like that. Yeah, that's got nice bitterness to it. You have to like that. If you like, well, and you're an IPA, and then yeah. If you, you like, like uh, IPA Northwest then. IPAs, this is definitely, definitely a good one. Yeah, you get all those different flavors in there too—the the pininess and, and the citrus. It's good. I'm still missing the tree. You're missing the tree. Yeah, we talked about this before. <laughs> I don't know. I guess I missed the pine tree. <laughs> I guess you need to chew on a few more branches. I do. All right, and on to our brew news. Talking this week's news, Peddler Brewing in Ballard is celebrating their third birthday this month. This Saturday, in fact, special beers on tap, limited supply, so come early if you'd like to try them. Belgian Triple Age with Brett and Blueberries. You've seen it in bottles, now it's finally on tap this weekend only. Oak Barrel Aged Belgian, last winter's light bodied Belgian double aged 14 months in oak whiskey barrels. Oak Barrel Aged Belgian Sour, same as previous one, but this one was aged with Brett, resulting in a lively sour and funky beer. They will give away Zip Up Peddler 22 ounce bomber koozies, free with a purchase of three 22 ounce bombers or buy one for seven dollars they will have a cornhole tournament live music and a food truck foggy noggin brewing in bothell turns six this month the small brewery run by jim jameson has lots planned to celebrate the event on friday march 18th he will host a vertical tasting of six years of their anniversary ale at the last time we checked there were only three slots available so it's possible it's sold out already Saturday, March 26th from noon to 5 p.m., they will be celebrating with a release of their 2016 Anniversary Ale in 22-ounce bottles and on tap. A effin' anniversary cake. Ten caps pouring traditional English ales. Wild kegs last. Pints of last year's Anniversary Ale and wild kegs last. Pints of effin' six Imperial 2016 Anniversary Ale. If you like English-style ales and want to drink in the owner's garage slash tap room, check it out. Several new brewery announcements. Figurehead Brewing is planning a seven-barrel brewery in the Ballard neighborhood of Seattle. Neighbors and home brewers Bob Monroe and Jesse Duncan, they also plan to concentrate on English ales like Ordinary Special and Extra Special Bitters, as well as Belgian-style beers, with the goal of making low-alcohol pub-style offerings that are sessionable and balanced with a concentration on malt and yeast, as opposed to the hop-forward beers so common in the Northwest. Triceratops Brewing in Olympia, our second interview on Northwest Brew Talk in early 2015, is going big time. Owner Rob Horn secured a building and is installing a 10-barrel system. 
And Washington Beer Blog pointed out that another brewery opened that missed our radar. Whipsaw Brewing in Ellensburg opened in late January, started by Charlie and Debbie Tierney. He had 20 years of home brewing experience. Lastly, Quartzite Brewing opened January 22nd in Chihuahua, started by Patrick Sawyer and Jake Wilson. The duo have been home brewing for just four years. They run a one-barrel system. Thanks to Rick Bonino for that update. Just a reminder to all the breweries out there, you have until March 31st to get your beers into the Washington Beer Awards, the craft beer competition designed specifically to support Washington's professional brewers. The second annual Vancouver Spring Brew Fest takes place March 18th and 19th at Esther Short Park. They're going to have beer and whiskey as well as food and a free throw contest and have March Madness on a large screen TV. Bushnell Craft Brewing Company will be hosting its second anniversary party in Pig Roast on March 19th, 2016 at the Bushnell Craft Taproom in Redmond. While we haven't covered much of the craft cider world, we will start adding some ciders to the tastings over the coming months, as well as news when we do come across it. To that end, Seattle Cider Company is excited to announce its popular line of seasonal ciders will now be available in the company's signature 16-ounce cans. Kicking off the new line will be the growing cidery's spring seasonal basil mint. Basil mint, available through May, will be followed by berry, pumpkin spice, and oaked maple, each released with the season and all available in 16-ounce cans. The Washington Cask Beer Festival also takes place this uh, on March 19th, which uh, is a very busy weekend. This event features one-of-a-kind handcrafted cask-conditioned beers from over 40 Washington breweries. The event still has some tickets available. It's at Seattle Exhibition or Seattle Center Exhibition Hall and is $40 in advance, $45 at the door. Admission includes a commemorative glass and samples 21 and over. And on March 26th, you can stop in at Whiskey Ridge Brewing in Arlington as they celebrate their first year in their Arlington location. And that is the brew news for this week. Welcome back to Northwest Brew Talk. If you want to submit news to Northwest Brew Talk, send us an email to nwbrewtalk at gmail.com. If you've not yet subscribed to our podcast, why not do it now? It's free, available anywhere you listen to podcasts, including iTunes, Podbean, Stitcher, and TuneIn Radio. Okay, time for our interview. We're going to talk to a uh, well-known brewer here in uh, Washington. His name is Kevin Ford. He's the head brewer and first employee at Flying Bike Cooperative Brewery in Seattle. Well, let's start out. You've got, uh, you've got a, a pretty long history of brewing here in Seattle, going back to the 90s, right? I do have a long history, uh, considering how short the history is of craft brewing. Yes. Uh, I started as a bottler. Okay. I go all the way back, because I used to drive a truck, a delivery, fish delivery truck on the waterfront. I was a home brewer. Perfect timing with the grill, yeah, huh? Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, and uh, there was a little homebrew shop, Liberty Malt Supply, on Western Avenue. I'd pick up my supplies. I was already fascinated by homebrewing. And one day I went in there, and I, they were working on something. It turned out they were installing a brewery there. Mm-hmm. And back then, this would have been 89, um, you know, now we're used to such things. Yeah. But it, my eyes got very big. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. I, and I said, Lordy. And I thought about it a while, and I s- just asked them if they wanted since I was driving a delivery truck, if they wanted a delivery driver. driver, And they said, maybe, we'll think about it. Called me a few months later and asked me if I wanted to sit on a milk crate and fill bottles one at a time with a homebrew counterpressure filler. And I said, you know, for like half the money I was making. So I leapt at the chance. (laughs) And um, that's how I learned to brew, is on the job and and brewed with uh, an extraordinary group of people, most of whom have gone on to be to do their own thing or certainly be part of great things mm-hmm. uh, just uh, we called it pike place academy it was a little ah, yeah. little brewery and we just needed a lot of us to make that beer we just had to brew you know at a certain point we were brewing uh 13 times a week mm. in a three and a half barrel system you just needed a lot of manpower and that was a lot of people learning how to brew yeah 
So I brewed there for seven years, including in that last year we uh, built the new brewery. Um, it is now known as Pike Brewing Company. When we moved from that location on Western to the new location, we moved out of the area of the Pike Place Market, and they would not allow us to retain that name. That's why Pike Place became Pike Brewing Company. Right. So I worked at the new brewery for a year and was offered the job of uh, head brewer at the Big Time Brewery in uh, University District, um, which I also left at. Um, and that's kind of where I made my reputation, I think I would say, such as it is, because I had, you know, I was running my own show and I had tremendous freedom to do what I wanted to. And uh, boy, any of us associated with the Big Time, I think, love the Big Time. It's a very special thing. Um, so I was there for seven years, and, mm. and uh, I moved out of the country for a couple of years, came back, and went to work for Dick Cantwell at Elysian. Um, he hired me to be the original head brewer of Elysian Fields down there by the stadiums. Um, it took us a while to get the brewery up and running. We did. I worked there for a little while and um, had a good time there. You know, very small brewery in the corner of that great you know, restaurant. Uh, met a lot of great people there as well and had a great time working for Elysian. Um, then I was offered a job at the Ram. So I was the original head brewer, not the original head brewer, I was the head brewer at the Northgate location of the Ram. I worked for the Ram for seven years, at the end of which I was promoted to a kind of a management position where I was able to travel between breweries, visit different brewers, and just get involved in. I learned a lot about, you know, brewing related work mm -hmm. not directly in the brewery right very valuable you know I was mm -hmm. getting a little older it was time to sort of uh, think about learning a little more gaining some new skills and uh, I have to confess that I think I discovered among other things that um, I needed to be in the brewery <laughs> <laughs> I just belong there yeah and um, when this I just saw uh, a little notice about this brewery that was looking for a, a brewer mm -hmm. and I dropped by I just came by kind of almost literally knocked on the door and they happened to be here that's how it began I just began talking to them and became very interested in what they were doing mm -hmm. this flying by cooperative brewery uh, a unique concept uh, I mean it's not entirely unique in that there are a few others in the country but not many this is the only one around here right. so it was a new small brewery in a neighborhood that I liked um, not far from where I lived, with people that were clearly enthusiastic about what they were doing. Yeah. Um, so I've been working for them since about April. Yeah. So what uh, what about about their concept really intrigued you? Well, I think that it is a true co-op owned by its membership. Mm -hmm. We call ourselves the uh, REI of brewing because people often ask that question, what is a co-op, what is a co-op brewery? Well, there is such a thing as sort of like a, a co-op structure. It's a standardized thing. There's a national organization. And we are, we work within that purview. Um, we are incorporated as a co-op. This isn't my area of expertise. You know, mm -hmm. we have David here. He might be able to ask, answer these questions better. Um, but for my purposes, as far as how I work and how the fact that this is a co-op affects me, it means that I'm directly involved with people who are interested in what I'm doing, people who are members of the co-op who are home brewers, mm -hmm. and also who are interested in beer, although they may, might not be home brewers. I get to work with them, so right. I'm surrounded by people, in, I'm interacting with people all the time who are asking me what I'm doing, who are helping me learn and learning from me. and, and uh, we're kind of new still, so we're mm. working on exactly how to, you know, to take advantage of this model that we have by finding new ways to involve everyone. And most of uh, it's mostly volunteer. There are five of us who are paid. I'm the only full-time employee. Um, everyone else is they're volunteering. Mm -hmm. They're volunteering time, often materials and, and expertise. I think there might be an idea some people might think it's a co-op it's kind of nothing against hippies but, but <laughs> think it's like a kind of a hippie thing it's probably kind of flaky and, and inefficient but um, these people who are running this we have a nine member board and of course many other people involved in many different ways and, and many of these people are very high functioning individuals mm -hmm. and they bring their expertise their different expertises to um, to the enterprise 
and so things tend to get done very well. Mm -hmm. um, so I think I think I started to say that this room here that we're sitting in kind of um, is a demonstration of what this being a co-op means to me. In that there's a tasting room right here, beautifully constructed, mm -hmm. open family friendly tall tables an open area like the neighborhood's living room I like to say or okay. den more like a den because mm -hmm. we have these tall ceilings concrete floors high tables kids toys it's kids and dogs here it's crazy and then right in the corner right over there I could throw a pint glass at it um, is the brewery where I work and make beer there's no f real physical or psychological separation mm -hmm. between the brewery and the tasting room right we make beer together we drink beer together interesting so from from your standpoint as a brewer, you really can't be one of those people who this is my brewery and I'm running because of this type of concept. Everybody has to be involved. That's right, and I have absolutely no trouble with that. Right. Um, you know, home brewers. What do they do? They get together in somebody's garage and they make beer together. Um, beer is more fun when you make it together. Yeah. So. Uh, no, and I get to do, you know, I'm in here in the morning, sometimes there's nobody here, and maybe I get an idea about something I want to brew, and I don't necessarily ask permission, mm -hmm. so I have plenty of opportunity to have my own fun and get into my own trouble and, and right. uh, <laughs> take a chance or two. So one of the one of the big things about the co-op is you get recipes from members. Yes, yes. So occasionally, um, it will be about two or three times a year, I believe, is what we're going to aim for. We'll have a competition. We've had several already. Um, so we choose a style, throw up, open it, um, the invitation to our membership who are home brewers to go ahead and brew a version of that style. Um, and then we rent out a room, um, find a space to do an actual kind of official, formal, blind tasting. So everyone who wants to attend who's a member can come in. We'll give you your score sheet. You go around, you taste the um, beers. They're identified only by number, and you rate them. Mm -hmm. And you can make notes on you know, flavor notes if you choose to, and uh, we collect those and then make a judgment. Again, the, the, those who decide, um, you know, are counting the tallies. Also, don't know what beer is mm -hmm. what, so it's a, it's a blind tasting. And the winning recipe um, becomes the recipe, the flying bike recipe of that style. So we have, I think, well, five going now that are the results of um, homebrew competition. So. Yes. So when, when, well, when you have, let, let, let's say you picked a style, let's just say it was an IPA that you were going to uh, do a competition on. Are, when, when you're choosing it, is it based on, do you have a certain criteria you're looking for, or does it have to be the style, or what are you, you looking know, it for? Has, we find these questions come up. It's yeah. a good question. So on a straightforward style like IPA, we go by the uh, BJCP guidelines, guidelines that are used by the Great American Beer Festival and most others. Um, however, we do find that for our purposes, we want to vary that a little bit. Mm -hmm. For instance, we, we wanted to do a winter warmer, um, and we didn't want to be... I mean, first of all, we looked up the style guidelines, and, and we it became a long discussion about, should we apply these? Should we alter it somewhat? And we ended up saying, you know, look, use the these as... Don't be constrained by these guidelines. Don't use spices if you don't want to mm -hmm. just something that you feel is a winter warmer right um, obviously we're a little you know we're just a family here mm -hmm. we're a team so we're not gonna, you know anything that works is going right. to be acceptable for something like the IPA well then I I wasn't here at that time but um, I believe that we probably did just go through those guidelines because that's a, a fairly defined style right um, we just had a porter competition, and we did use the, those guidelines mm -hmm. for that. We are going to do a red ale next, and who knows what a red ale is. So in that case, once again, we'll say, you know, nobody know, really knows what it is. BJCP is attempting to define it, but they're, you know, they have trouble defining it. So let's let's just uh, have fun and may the best beer win. Okay, interesting. So, what? Uh, what do you think? You've been doing this for long enough, especially in, in this area where you know there's over 300 breweries now. Um, what do you think of today compared to you know 20 years ago? Well, you know there was that first big um, explosion in the 90s, and then a kind of a fallout. Um, not a kind of a fallout. It was a fallout. Um, people grew too fast. It was kind of trendy. People overinvested. Money people got into it to make money, which is the worst possible reason to start making beer. Um, 
And there was a shakeout and kind of a readjustment. Even though the market continued to grow, there was kind of the... Some people got too big and went away. Mm -hmm. This feels completely different. It feels quite organic. A lot of little guys mm -hmm. and gals, I should yes. say. And uh, it, even though we all talk about, you know, when is the, when's it going to start to constrict a little mm -hmm. bit, or when is, or you know, it seems like every little brewery that opens on every corner just goes gangbusters immediately and doesn't stop growing. Well, yeah. it seems that there must be some limit on that. But I've been saying there must be a limit for years now, and, and it, it still seems to work all the time. Yeah. I've always loved the brew pub model, and, mm -hmm. and just as there have always been taverns, you know, on every corner there could be a tavern. Why not? Why shouldn't that tavern be a brew pub? So I suppose there could be countless little breweries around. Yeah. But as far as it being like the thing that everyone's talking about, that everyone is sort of emotionally invested in, that, that you know, that makes it into all the papers and magazines, and um, that people. You know, maybe in a year or two it'll be distilling or something else. Not that distilling isn't right. really That's happening huge now. Say too. It is huge. <laughs> well, I guess my answer is, I, you know, as far as... I think it, it is different than before. Mm -hmm. It's It has more to do with smaller breweries that are tied to their neighborhoods. Perhaps smaller breweries tied to their na neighborhoods that have then found themselves able to sell large mm -hmm. amounts of beer. They maintain their quality. They get bigger. Maybe they have to find new breweries in other places, larger breweries looking for more affordable square footage. This is the story of a lot of breweries. Um, what happens in that kind of market when people start running into each other, competing for a shelf space mm -hmm. in grocery chains, for example? Right. Um, that's kind of another story than what I'm interested in, mm -hmm. which is, you know, the brew pub on the corner or the small brewery tasting room. I think those are, might be two separate phenomena. Um, I think it would be the middle-sized guys. Again, I, this isn't my area of expertise. There are a lot of people thinking really hard about this. Um, I think that they might find their world a little bit constrained in the future. And, of course, who knows what, you know, the elephant in the room is going to do to us to, you know, either buy us or kill us or yeah. both. Um, but, oh, you know, if there's always been beer, there always will be beer. Beer's just going to continue to get better. And the fact that you can know your brewer, your brewer lives in your neighborhood, um, it's a beautiful thing. It's the way it used to be, and that's mm -hmm. the way it is now, and it's going to stay that way. Yeah. yeah, I think you're right about the brew pub. The, the those could survive in a lot of a lot of areas, not just Seattle, but a lot of cities and small towns because you know, that's what it was. They had a little brewery in the back, and you know they had the, the tavern up front. Right. So th those could probably, but you're, you're probably right. You know those those medium sized ones that either need to get bigger or need shelf space. That might be the ones that get squeezed out eventually. Yeah, they're they're you know they're in a business. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. They're all in a business, but they're yeah. they're the ones where they're scratching their heads and yeah. they're making real strategic decisions and yeah. they're trying to figure out how to what to do in the market that they're in yeah yeah definitely so you've got uh, a little barrel project we were talking about because we're drinking some of it right now um so what made you want to uh, to do some barrels you know we haven't been open very long and we're kind of well, the people who founded and are running flying bike cooperative brewery obviously are very interested in beer mm -hmm. and they're doing it for fun right so in answer to your question somebody just got a line on somebody who got a line on somebody who got a line on some <laughs> rye whiskey barrels and they said do you want some kevin and i said if you're asking trying to find somebody to say no you're asking the wrong guy <laughs> so so they brought him in and then we decided what to do with them so that's why i brewed this russian imperial stout i didn't decide to acquire bourbon or rye whiskey barrels to put a Russian Imperial Stout in. Somebody brought me rye whiskey barrels, so I decided I'd better brew a Russian Imperial Stout. That's a perfectly valid way of craft brewing. Mm -hmm. um, improvising, taking advantage of opportunities. Um, and So now I have these barrels. They're on their second use, or soon will be. I have six of them. Six of the big guys, a couple little guys, and I just got a couple of uh, Bordeaux barrels. And that, that was the same kind of notion. They came at us by surprise. They were given to us by a 
a wonderful person who's a member. Um, and I thought, well, I've got this big Belgian thing. I'll put some of that in one, and then I'm doing a rye saison in a couple of weeks, so I'll put that in the other one. That sounds good. Um, but now we have these barrels, and we're starting to think about you know what you do with barrels. I'm learning a little bit about it. I've used barrels a little bit in the past, but not extensively, and now I'm learning about you know the sort of standard protocol for taking advantage of this opportunity, which is you do a couple of uses, you get the wood and the whiskey out of them, and then they go a little bit neutral, and then you that's when you start letting them go bad. So okay. that's our future. Okay. So uh, how many barrels are you projected to do this year? Well, we're, I brew about once, what is it, like three, 400 barrels this year. Um, hopefully, and as we, what we expect is that we'll be, you know, just doing better and better business right here in the tasting room mm -hmm. and that we'll be up to full capacity which will be five or six hundred barrels um, and then acquire another tank which will allow us to do a little better um, we're also kind of looking for that sweet spot where we can uh, maintain ourselves uh, not always be automatically thinking of uh, the next you know rung in the ladder maybe we find mm -hmm. a rung that we like and just stay there. Just stay yeah, there. yeah, it's possible. I mean, I think what I expect what will happen is we'll continue to grow as breweries tend naturally to do. They uh -huh. just seem to want to keep moving like sharks, I guess. Though. Right. Um, and I guess that's what we're we're going to do. But um, as I said, you know, just making talking about brew pubs. Um, you know, a brew pub is a nice model, and maybe we build another brewery somewhere else, keep this one going as it is. But that's getting a little ahead of myself. Sure. Over the years or now, any certain malts or hops that you really like to work with? Well, I'm kind of an old-time guy from Seattle, from the Northwest. I'm like the sea hops. I still love those things. I st I, I, I've always loved Chinook and Centennial. Now, those hops drift, but, you know, you go back to them, and there's a, they always have something to give. And uh, these nice new ones, um, of course, Simcoe Amarillo and Citra, which everybody wants, which is why I can't find them. <laughs> um, um, and then the New Zealand and Australian hops, uh, Nelson Savan and, and what, what is it, Wataku, it's the other one, um, Mosaic, the kind of earthy, sweaty, stinky ones. Um, mm -hmm. That's a whole, kind of another, I think of those as being a, you know, it used to be you could go piney, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, citrusy, and then there are the, the, the noble hops, which could be a little grassy or, a, or maybe herbal, something like that. But now we have, you know, dank and tropical and things like that, and those flavors have always been, you know, available somewhere. But now, boy, you know, hops are... One of the fun things about being a brewer is, in this day and age, is that you just have more to play with all mm -hmm. the time. You know, that right. whole network, the whole world of people that are making beer together, they're all finding new things and we're all kind of playing together. And the sandbox is getting bigger. <laughs> right. So... I should say something about malt because... Oh, yeah. uh, we're lucky that Skagit Valley Maltings up in the Skagit Valley is beginning, and that there are, you know, Don Webb, the great brewer from Naked City, which is right next door to us, drove up there a while ago in his Mini Cooper, and they gave us a whole tour, spent many hours with us, and showed us the whole fascinating operation. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I've talked about hops, but generally, although there are many great malts that you can get from around the world, it's been sort of a standardized, you know, palette, if you will, um, to choose from. Now there's a new thing happening just up the street, and they're being adventurous. They they're just you know figuring it out as they go along. And I've had the um, honor and opportunity to brew a few times in different ways with uh, with their malt, okay. uh, flying envelope, and uh, excuse me, <laughs> flying bike and lucky envelope. We did a brew together called Flying Envelope. Oh, they okay. they were kind enough to reach out to us and ask if we'd like to collaborate with them. Mm -hmm. So we together brewed at a lager at Lucky Envelope. We call it Flying Envelope, and it's Skagit Valley malt, um, a little bit of Chinook Centennial, and a nice Bavarian lager yeast. It's a, a, and it, uh, being kind of a clean um, uh, beer, it really features the 
amazing flavorfulness of that malt um, from Skagit Valley. So Skagit Valley maltings. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm really looking forward to using more of that malt. Uh, whatever they have that, that they come up with, it'll be the kind of thing I think that I used to do with hop growers, where I could call them up and say, "Well, you know, every month or two, and say, well, what you got going on that's new?'" Mm-hmm. And to do that with a maltings, yeah. is, that's mind blowing for me. Yeah, it's it's pretty amazing that I mean they could pretty much customize, you know, the malt to to whatever your specification. You can are. actually eventually the plan would be that you can choose a variety. Mm-hmm. You know, you can choose a variety of barley that they've never malted before mm-hmm. and say malt some up for me. Yeah, I mean obviously they're not going to do that for Flying Bite because they need to sell more than you know three hundred fifty pounds, but. Right. Um, you know, in collaboration, we'll all yeah. figure out how to do it together to, to make it work for everybody. You know, brewers will cooperate. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely definitely something in the future, and you know, like you said, right up the road. So that's something that uh, definitely be able to uh, see a lot of in, in this area. Yeah, and you'd be amazed how much grain you can put in a Mini Cooper if you really <laughs> want to. Yeah, Don was like loading up because we didn't expect they were going to sell us malt when we mm-hmm. went up there. But on the way out the door, says, "You want to buy some of this malt?" Said, really? There's a pallet of bags there. So uh, Don starts putting one bag after another in his Mini Cooper, and he's kind of, but he's weighing it out in specific gravity. He says, "This is 1026, 1032, 1036 <laughs> you know, for his little five barrel system." And eventually, he said, "You know, if I want to get the gravity I want, Kevin, you're, I'm going to have to leave you here." But, <laughs> So I put one on my lap and we did it. <laughs> so you've already done a couple collaborations. You did one yes. with Naked City, yes. too, right? Yes, uh, that was hilarious. Don and I, uh, they've been nothing but kind and welcoming to us, which is amazing because you know, our wall, the wall of this brewery is the wall of their beer garden. Okay. Imagine if you're a crap brewery and somebody does that to you. It's yeah. like there are two ways you can respond. I guess yeah. there are countless ways you can respond, but they've, they've been nothing but helpful. And, of course, Don and I, we can't help but we're a couple of brewers. We're just having a blast. So we're, we're talking about it one day, and I was thinking, you know, you have these, he's got seven-barrel fermenters and 15s, and I'm, he's got a five-barrel brew house. I have a seven-barrel brew house. And it didn't take long to think about how, whether we had hosing to make it across the parking lot. So eventually what we did is we brewed what we called the, once again, this was with the Skagit Valley Mall. It was a golden ale. Uh, we call it, my sister accuses Don and me of having a brewmance. <laughs> so we call it Brewmance Golden Ale, first in the Wirt Line of Friendship series. So what we did is we, we mashed in over here, boiled over here, and then we knocked out, put all our hoses together, knocked out across the parking lot into his fermenter. And we, um, we spray painted a tri clamp gold so that it, we were doing the old. Uh, um, Continental Railroad, the joining of the railroads thing, <laughs> and the golden spikes. We had the golden tri clamp. We had a little ceremony. We tried to get some people out here to have fun with this, which they did, and had some pictures taken. And uh, boy, it was hard to brew. We were laughing so hard. But <laughs> and we're going to do it again for Seattle Beer Week. We have plans to brew another one during Seattle Beer Week and try to get, rather than brew one together for pouring during Seattle Beer Week, we want to do the brewing Seattle, during Seattle okay. Beer Week so we can um, have an even bigger group of brewers to help us mm-hmm. along and to get in the way nice. so what uh, what do you see uh, you know down the road for yourself or, or for the climb bike uh, you know I'm we are so new and this is a new honor pleasure for me working with the flying bike I'm not thinking very far ahead. I'm, okay. I'm thinking about getting that next IPA brewed because mm-hmm. I think I'm a little behind on that. And that would be embarrassing not to have IPA. <laughs> um, I have a lot of different things in mind that I want to try here. I mean, I want to do the Sour Barrel program if I have the, the guts to get that going. Um, I do want to play with that different kind of malt. Um, I would just love to... We have a, a beer engine was gifted to us mm. from Central Co-op. That's why the, okay. the handle there has the nice... Um, metal, you know, the welded artsy mm-hmm. sign on their central co-op. Um, and it's a great beer engine. And our c- uh, customers have responded to that. I oh, thought yeah. maybe I could sell a quarter barrel a week, and they're, they're easily drinking up a half barrel in, a, in two or three days. Wow. So uh, that inspires me. I love the cask tradition. I love mm-hmm. English beers, and, and now I can try to do that. 
um, really intentionally brew a nice ordinary bitter or something like that. Um, I'm getting excited just thinking about it. So, I mean, I I have a little brewery here that I can play with, and, mm -hmm. and um, it's hard for me to imagine um, letting go of that opportunity anytime soon. And also, it's it's really fun to collaborate with other members. Right. Also, um, growing up, collaborating with them in in turning a five or ten barrel batch into a seven barrel batch, it's a technical challenge that I also mm -hmm. enjoy, and one yeah. that most brewers don't really have, and mm -hmm. I have it over and over again, and I've learned a lot that way. Right. Um, as for the future of the flying bike, I think it's it's you know it's going to keep growing. It's it's self sustaining. It doesn't have to. I mean, it's a more modest. How am I trying to put this? It's um, all we have to do is survive and and have fun, mm -hmm. um, and we're going to do both of those things. Looking at the beers, at least half of them are your own. Yes, at this point, that's about how it shakes out. Yeah. yeah. Is there? Um, some balance or you know it's it's um Still it, it just kind of, kind of we we really didn't expect when we started uh, you know our, we were open to the public in mid-august um all these handles weren't there yet we didn't hmm. anticipate that we would be able to brew so much beer fill so many handles mm -hmm. um as quickly as we did it just i just kept brewing is what happened and you know things started to go well and and uh so that it kind of, we have more than enough handles here now. We have 16. Some people say maybe that's a little too many. Um, so what's going to happen is more and more member recipes will be chosen. And some of them will go in and out of rotation. Like obviously a winter warmer is a seasonal beer. Some of them will come and go. We have a porter winter that's the next one I'm going to brew. Um, that may or may not be on at all times. So we'll figure it out down the line. Of course, any good brewery tasting room wants to try new things and wants there to be variety. People come in, I'm, I'm just so pleased and grateful that in Seattle and in the region and I guess everywhere now, customers are so well informed and curious. So they will come in and say, what's new? And they right. ask about, they want, they're knowledgeable and curious mm -hmm. and, and, and invested in it. And in the case of Flying Bike, many of them are literally invested in yeah. it. <laughs> and, uh, so I want to, you know, we're in the entertainment business in a way, and, and uh, I want to keep them entertained by changing it up and, and exploring new areas and doing new things always. And, and I'm lucky that, being that this is a co-op, I have a huge pool of talent and expertise to draw from. There are so many great home brewers around. I'll tell you a little story that the latest home brewer who won the latest competition for our porter. We had a fine porter, and he's an excellent home brewer, somebody I've known for quite a while, and he came in with the recipe so we could talk about it, and he brought out his, his he says, okay, Kevin, here's my recipe. He brings out his first sheet is just water treatment, water chemistry. Mm. <laughs> and I just said, you know, I, I don't, I can't even pronounce half of these words, let alone, <laughs> you know, I don't play with my water very much. So this is another instance of among many when I, you know, I just say, school me, you know, yeah. teach me something. Because these, you know, a lot of them, face it, are Boeing engineers, as, mm -hmm. uh, as is this person. And uh, they don't fool around when they, with their hobbies. They, uh, they do it right. And uh, I'm looking forward to learning, never stopping learning from, from and, and I have a lot of great teachers. Oh, very cool. Thanks very much for oh. taking some time talking Thank to you, us. Thank you, Mike. I really appreciate it. It's been a pleasure. Thanks. Alright, thank you very much to Kevin from Flying Bike for joining us today. We will be right back after a local music break from Amy Viking.
different limes by amy viking you can check them out at amyviking.bandcamp.com if you want to have your music played on northwest brew talk contact us today for now let's try another beer this time we have northwest red ale from 12 bar brews 12 bar brews is located in woodenville their turnaround Northwest Red Ale is copper going on ruby red with a slightly sweeter feel than the rest of their beers. The malt gives the beer a pleasant medium caramel flavor. Six different hops are used in this beer, including Chinook, which adds a Northwest Outdoors pine aroma, a strong homage to the style. It's 5.7% ABV and 45 IBUs with an untapped rating of 3.36. Definitely coppery. I don't know. I guess there might be borderline red. So I guess uh, they're yeah, not there's too. There's a bit far of red up. in it. Nice smell. Oh, that yeah, is... the smell is different. The taste is different wow, too. Yeah. Wow. I almost thought it was like cinnamon. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. Yeah, that is definitely something different. It's got a nice head on it too. Nice thick, foamy head, and it does. Uh, we don't really know what that special flavor is, but that's something different. I'm kind of surprised by the lower lower end of three there on the untapped rating. Usually, that you would think that would be a little higher. Maybe it's because it tastes a little different. But I either like that it a lot. or because it's supposed to be a red ale, and maybe it doesn't quite fall into that to some people's uh, liking. Maybe yeah. Because this this one actually both of these had quite a few reviews. So uh, over 300 for one of them and 600 for another. So both of these beers tonight had some a lot of people reviewed. Oh okay yeah. Yeah, but that's definitely different. I'm, I'm, I don't know what that is, but I keep. T- I as soon as I taste it, I think cinnamon candy. Hmm, really? Yeah, it's weird. Hmm, but that, yeah, it was good. That's good. I like that a lot. All right, definitely something different. Nice. Why don't you give me fresh beer? <laughs> you serious? <laughs> no. This week's fresh beer is Rain Shadow CDA from Anacortes Brewery. It's a traditional Northwest-style Cascadian dark ale. Dark, robust, and aggressively hopped with Columbus, Simcoe, and Cascade. Then triple dry hopped, 6.1% ABV and 80 IBUs. 
And that brings us to the end of this episode of Northwest Brew Talk. Make sure to tune in next week when we chat with Lake Taps Brewing. This show is produced and edited by me with engineering help from Michelle Rizzo. If you want to contact us, you can email us at nwbrewtalk at gmail.com or on Twitter at nwbrewtalk. Our theme music is from Gilbert Neal at gilbertneal.com. Until next time, I'm Mike Rizzo. And I'm Michelle Rizzo. Stay hoppy, my friends. Topping this week's news, Peddler Brewing in Ballard is celebrating. Celebrating? Celebrating. <laughs> no, I just. Okay, we got a for this show. <laughs>